Book 2 Chapter 1 I wish now to review in memory my past wickedness and the carnal corruptions of my soul, not because I still love them, but that I may love thee, O my God. For love of thy love I do this, recalling in the bitterness of self-examination my wicked ways, that thou mayst grow sweet to me, thou sweetness without deception, thou sweetness happy and assured. Thus thou mayest gather me up out of those fragments in which I was torn to pieces, while I turned away from thee, O unity, and lost myself among the many. For as I became a youth, I longed to be satisfied with worldly things, and I dared to grow wild in a succession of various and shadowy loves. My form wasted away, and I became corrupt in thy eyes. Yet I was still pleasing to my own eyes, and eager to please the eyes of men. Chapter 2 But what was it that delighted me, save to love and to be loved? Still, I did not keep the moderate way of the love of mind to mind, the bright path of friendship. Instead, the mists of passion steamed up out of the puddly concupience of the flesh and the hot imagination of puberty, and they so obscured and overcast my heart that I was unable to distinguish pure affection from unholy desire. Both boiled confusedly within me and dragged my unstable youth down over the cliffs of unchaste desires and plunged me into a gulf of infamy. Thy anger had come upon me, and I knew it not. I had been defeated by the clanking of the chains of my mortality, the punishment for my soul's pride, and I wandered farther from thee, and thou didst permit me to do so. I was tossed to and fro, and wasted, and poured out, and I boiled over in my fornications and yet thou didst hold thy peace, O oh, my tardy joy. Thou didst still hold thy peace, and I wandered still farther from thee into more and yet more barren fields of sorrow, in proud dejection and restless lassitude. If only there had been someone to regulate my disorder and turn to my profit the fleeting beauties of the things around me, and to fix a bound to their sweetness, so that the tides of my youth might have spent themselves upon the shore of marriage. Then they might have been tranquilized and satisfied with having children, as thy law prescribes, O Lord. O thou who dost form the offspring of our death, and art able also with a tender hand to blunt the thorns which were excluded from thy paradise. For thy omnipotence is not far from us, even when we are far from thee. Now on the other hand, I might have given more vigilant heed to the voice from the clouds. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. And it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And he that is unmarried cares for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord, but he that is married cares for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. I should have listened more attentively to these words, and, thus having been, made a eunuch for the kingdom of heaven's sake, I would have, with greater happiness, expected thy embraces. But, fool that I was, I foamed in my wickedness as the sea, and, forsaking thee, followed the rushing of my own tide, and burst out of all thy bounds. But I did not escape thy scourges. For what mortal can do so? Thou wast always by me, mercifully angry, and flavouring all my unlawful pleasures with bitter discontent, in order that I might seek pleasures free from discontent. But where could I find such pleasure save in thee, O Lord, save in thee, who dost teach us by sorrow, who woundest us to heal us, and dost kill us, that we may not die apart from thee? Where was I? And how far was I exiled from the delights of thy house in that sixteenth year of the age of my flesh, when the madness of lust held full sway in me, that madness which grants indulgence to human shamelessness, even though it is forbidden by thy laws, and I gave myself entirely to it. Meanwhile, my family took no care to save me from ruin by marriage, for their sole care 
was that I should learn how to make a powerful speech and become a persuasive orator. Chapter 3 Now, in that year my studies were interrupted. I had come back from Medora, a neighboring city where I had gone to study grammar and rhetoric, and the money for a further term at Carthage was being got together for me. This project was more a matter of my father's ambition than of his means, for he was only a poor citizen of Tagesti. To whom am I narrating all this? Not to thee, O my God, but to my own kind in thy presence, to that small part of the human race who may chance to come upon these writings. And to what end? That I and all who read them may understand what depth there are from which we are to cry unto thee, for what is more surely heard in thy ear than a confessing heart and a faithful life? Who did not extol and praise my father, because he went quite beyond his means to supply his son with the necessary expenses for a far journey in the interest of his education? For many far richer citizens did not do so much for their children. Still, this same father troubled himself not at all as to how I was progressing toward thee, nor how chaste I was, just so long as I was skilful in speaking, no matter how barren I was to thy tillage, O God, who art the one true and good Lord of my heart, which is thy field. During that sixteenth year of my age, I lived with my parents, having a holiday from school for a time. This idleness imposed upon me by my parents' straitened finances the thorn bushes of lust drew rank about my head, and there was no hand to root them out. Indeed, when my father saw me one day at the baths, and perceived that I was becoming a man, and was showing the signs of adolescence, he joyfully told my mother about it, as if already looking forward to grandchildren, rejoicing in that sort of inebriation in which the world so often forgets thee, its creator, and falls in love with thy creature, instead of thee the inebriation of that invisible wine of a perverted will which turns and bows down to infamy. But in my mother's breast thou hast already begun to build thy temple and the foundation of thy holy habitation, whereas my father was only a catechumen, and that but recently. She was, therefore, startled with a holy fear and trembling, for though I had not yet been baptized, she feared those crooked ways in which they walk who turn their backs to thee, and not their faces. Woe is me! Do I dare affirm that thou didst hold thy peace, O my God, while I wandered farther from thee? Didst thou really then hold thy peace? Then whose words were they but thine, which by my mother, thy faithful handmaid, thou didst pour into my ears? None of them, however, sank into my heart to make me do anything. She deplored, and, as I remember, warned me privately, with great solicitude, not to commit fornication, but above all things never to defile another man's wife. These appeared to me but womanish counsels, which I would have blushed to obey. Yet they were from thee, and I knew it not. I thought that thou wast silent, and that it was only she who spoke. Yet it was through her that thou didst not keep silent toward me, and in rejecting her counsel I was rejecting thee, I, her son, the son of thy handmaid, thy servant. But I did not realize this, and rushed on headlong with such blindness that among my friends I was ashamed to be less shameless than they when I heard them boasting of their disgraceful exploits. Yes, and glory in all the more the worse their baseness was. What is worse, I took pleasure in such exploits, not for the pleasure's sake only, but mostly for praise. What is worthy of vituperation except vice itself? Yet I made myself out worse than I was, in order that I might not go lacking for praise. And when in anything I had not sinned as the worst ones in the group, I would still say that I had done what I had not done, in order not to appear contemptible because I was more innocent than they, and not to drop in their esteem 
because I was more chaste. Behold with what companions I walked the streets of Babylon. I rolled in its mire and lolled about on it, as if on a bed of spices and precious ointments. And drawing me closely to the very center of that city, my invisible enemy trod me down and seduced me, for I was easy to seduce. My mother had already fled out of the midst of Babylon, and was progressing, albeit slowly, towards its outskirts. For in counseling me to chastity, she did not bear in mind what her husband had told her about me. And, although she knew that my passions were destructive even then, and dangerous for the future, she did not think that they should be restrained by the bonds of conjugal affection, if, indeed, they could not be cut away to the quick. She took no heed of this, for she was afraid lest a wife should prove a hindrance and a burden to my hopes. These were not her hopes of the world to come, which my mother had in thee, but the hope of learning, which both my parents were too anxious that I should acquire, my father because he had little or no thought of thee, and only vain thoughts for me, my mother because she thought that the usual course of study would not only be no hindrance, but actually a furtherance toward my eventual return to thee. This much I conjecture, recalling as well as I can the temperance of my parents. Meantime, the reins of discipline were slackened on me, so that without the restraint of due severity I might play at whatsoever I fancied, even to the point of dissoluteness. And in all this there was that mist which shut out from my sight the brightness of thy truth, O my God. And my iniquity bulged out, as it were, with fatness. Chapter 4 Theft is punished by thy law, O Lord and by the law written in men's hearts, which not even ingrained wickedness can erase. For what thief will tolerate another thief stealing from him? Even a rich thief will not tolerate a poor thief who is driven to theft by want. Yet I had a desire to commit robbery, and did so, compelled to it by neither hunger nor poverty, but through a contempt for well-doing and a strong impulse to iniquity for I pilfered something which I already had in sufficient measure, and of much better quality. I did not desire to enjoy what I stole, but only the theft and the sin itself. There was a pear tree close to our own vineyard, heavily laden with fruit, which was not tempting either for its colour or for its flavour. Late one night, having prolonged our games in the streets until then, as our bad habit was, a group of young scoundrels, and I among them, went to shake and rob this tree. We carried off a huge load of pears, not to eat ourselves, but to dump out to the hogs, after barely tasting some of them ourselves. Doing this pleased us all the more, because it was forbidden. Such was my heart, O God, such was my heart, which thou didst pity even in that bottomless pit. Behold! Now let my heart confess to thee what it was seeking there, when I was being gratuitously wanton, having no inducement to evil but the evil itself. It was foul, and I loved it. I loved my own undoing. I loved my error, not that for which I erred, but the error itself. A depraved soul, falling away from security in thee to destruction in itself, seeking nothing from the shameful deed, but shame itself. Chapter 5 Now, there is a comeliness in all beautiful bodies, and in gold and silver and all things. The sense of touch has its own power to please, and the other senses find their proper objects in physical sensation. Worldly honour also has its own glory, and so do the powers to command and to overcome and from these there springs up the desire for revenge. Yet, in seeking these pleasures, we must not depart from thee, O Lord, nor deviate from thy law. The life which we live here has its own peculiar attractiveness, because it has a certain measure of comeliness of its own and a harmony with all these inferior values. 